Okay, so the, uh, first I want to thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, the uh, FTPI is very, very um, thoughtful and I've enjoyed the conference. So they asked me to do something different to change things. So I will start by uh, asking you to participate in a few slides. So let me start. So uh, in the next hour, we'll talk about the evolution of innovation systems because in America, the way to do innovation is ahead of the rest of the world. So I will teach you some of the ways that it is uh, advancing. The other thing is um, we, we like to help people learn how to release their creativity. So if you think about it, America has a lot of Steve Jobs. They have Elon Musk, they have Thomas Edison. Who is the Steve Jobs of Thailand? You don't have one yet, but it's out there. You actually have the creativity, and we want to find how to bring that out. Uh, next, we want to uh, learn how to engage with your team so that there's true leadership for innovation. And then you could actually change the culture of Thailand by changing the culture of innovation inside of its companies. And then uh, we'll talk about how blockchains and the digital revolution can actually drive uh, innovation change. Okay, so this is the first slide. This is the growth of, let's see, where's the light? I don't see the, anyway, the, this is the growth of patents over, over the world. So it actually goes up. But I want you to know one thing. If you look at the um, standings of Thailand in the World Infra uh, Intellectual Property Organization of the UN, Thailand is flat. It is not growing because patents are very expensive and difficult in this country. And countries like the US and China, they make the patent laws easier to get patents and cheaper. So right now um, in the Global, Global Innovation uh, Index, uh, Thailand is actually last in Southeast Asia for medium-sized countries. Even Vietnam is above uh, Thailand. So I think that the goal for uh, Thailand should actually to beat Vietnam, okay? So how many of you think that would be a good idea, to beat Vietnam? No? Okay, good. Let's, uh, let's talk about what it will take to do that. So here's the other thing. This is the number of PhDs granted annually. So it is growing. So the human race is actually becoming more and more uh, educated. The really amazing thing is that if you take every scientist who ever lived in history, 90% of the scientists for all of humanity are alive today. That means right now you have 10 times more scientists than all the scientists in history, all the PhDs. So that's another thing that's happening is that the growth of PhDs is increasing. Uh, if you look at the productivity output per hour, uh, in the United States it's actually growing quite well, uh, and it's actually outpacing median family income. That means that the human race is actually becoming smarter in how it works, and productivity is increasing worldwide. So if you put this all together, what this tells you is that innovation is actually part of being human. So from the invention of fire and, and uh, the wheel, uh, people have been uh, driving it. And the way to do innovation has also been in improving. In the 50s, it was called f functionalism and operationalism. In the 60s, ergonomics came out, then systems thinking. In the 90s, uh, user-centric design was created at Stanford University. And now it's a new thing called design thinking which we'll talk about in what we're doing. These, uh, so if you look at what's happening now, Thailand is still in the systems thinking lean era, but the rest of Silicon Valley is already like two decades ahead in design thinking, and that's probably the most important thing for Thailand to learn is how to do design uh, thinking. Okay, this digital power is actually driving many things. The, uh, if you look at Moore's law, the computers get faster you know, every 18 months. Uh, the biology revolution is actually based on that. So DNA sequencers are getting cheaper and faster. The cost of the very first uh, human genome to be sequenced was $5 billion, and now it's down to $5. So it's actually improving how to do this. The energy revolution, uh, lithium-ion batteries are getting cheaper every year. 
And, it's, and even though you can't increase the energy density of batteries uh, exponentially, the cost of them is actually uh, uh, improving quite well as well as solar. So if you put all of this together, what's happening is that there is a speed up in humanity. So it used to take 100 years for a new technology to be adopted by an entire country. So if you look at automobiles and telephones, it took over 100 years for, I think, 90% of the households to get them. And then television was like 30 years. PCs were like uh, under 20 years. Cellular was 10 years. How long did it take Facebook to reach 100 million households? Do you know? Six months. So these technologies are adopted faster and faster. And if you look at what's happening, uh, the reason this is happening is because these four things, computing doubles every 18 months, communication doubles every nine months, Storage doubles every 12 months. And content actually is growing exponentially, so that the value of the internet just increases very, very fast as an exponential. If you multiply these together, that means that networking and computers costs 95 to 97% cheaper every 10 years. And when you do this, it actually drives a digital revolution. Okay? So that means that everything that you can think of is now being digitized. And it's changing everything uh, in the world. And you can't stop this. And it's actually a useful uh, to exercise to figure out how you can adopt digitization faster. So this is how Thailand can win. There's a storm coming of three new technologies, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. How many of you have heard of blockchains? OK, how many of you have heard of artificial intelligence? How many of you have heard of quantum computing? OK, so uh, these are the hot areas of investment in Silicon Valley. And the investment in these have not started in Southeast Asia. So what we want to do is talk about how these are being uh, viewed in uh, other countries and to help uh, Thailand get uh, acceleration in this area. So these three things, blockchain, um, is being built in now into significant new uh, technologies. It's probably the most important uh, revolution to happen for present-day computing. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, predicted to be a $400 billion market. And if you look at your Apple phone uh, with Siri, uh, it's already happening today. And it's uh, very powerful. The final one is quantum uh, computing, which is still five to 10 years away. But there are actually ways to do quantum computing today around an optimization that are quite fast as well. So this is why this is important. If you look at, here it goes. So computer chips get twice as fast every 18 months according to Moore's law. Now this gives you the ability to speed up exponentially, but that rate of change is predictable. You can actually predict it. You can say next year the computer is going to be faster so you can guess what you need to do to compete. Google just released um, a paper late last year. They invented the world's first quantum computer that could solve a problem that would take the IBM supercomputer 10,000 years to calculate and did it in 200 seconds. And it was published in Nature. And it's peer reviewed, so it's actually happening. That means the quantum revolution has begun already. And it's important for every country to understand this and catch up. The reason is because this is not twice as fast every month. This is 1.5 time, billion times faster overnight. The minute a scientist figures out how to break encryption using a quantum computer, every single computer system is at risk. And it will cost uh, people to spend over $100 billion upgrading their systems. So if you're ahead of the curve, you'll make $100 billion. And if you're behind, you'll be spending $100 billion. So it's important to understand how this, this quantum revolution causes an overnight discontinuous change, which is much greater than you've ever experienced. So already, it feels like we're you know, changing too fast. But the amount of change or the rate of change will increase uh, exponentially so that it will be like crazy fast. OK, um, this quantum revolution will uh, impact every industry. Computer security is the first one. It'll uh, invalidate all encryption. 
Another one is drug discovery, because you can uh, figure out how the human uh, genome produces proteins, you now map against that, and you can discover new drugs. So quantum computing and human geno genetics will actually un unlock new uh, drugs over the next 20 years. Climate change. This is actually the interesting one. Uh, everyone says, oh my god, climate change is very difficult, you know, to fix it. There's a company in Iceland making uh, catalyst technology, and they actually already have it so you could take carbon and turn it into water and uh, water and something else, I forget. But it, it actually produces, it actually requires energy to be put in. So they're going to use quantum computers to find an exothermic reaction that does that. If you put this in every car, it would have probably solved the climate problem. So these things can be solved by quantum computers, and it's worthwhile learning how to do this uh, new technology. Okay, so that means that we're not looking at 10x improvement every 10 years. We're looking at maybe 1,000x. And this is actually what uh, every country is facing in the next five to 10 years, except that if you're so busy dealing with a small change, you can't see this coming. So this is like a tsunami is going to hit the world, and you need to prepare for it today by understanding it, by funding scientists to be on the, the leading edge of this wave instead of being hit by it. Okay? Does this all make sense? I was going to take a quick break. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Is this interesting? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to do three exercises from Silicon Valley, okay? The first exercise is I want everyone to stand up and stretch. Come on, stand up. So stretch. Okay, so the first lesson here is that the way you win, increase the energy level. All right? So how do you say uh, Thailand number one in Thai? Okay, everyone start. With the, I want to put this on camera. So let me videotape all of you screaming that as loud as possible. Okay? Uh, so let's, we just do it for 10 seconds. Uh, let me tell you when the camera is on. Okay, everybody scream as loud as possible, Thailand number one. Let's go. Thailand number one. Thailand number one. Thailand number one. Okay, so that's the first lesson. Energy level higher. Okay, second lesson. Social networking. Uh, take out your business card. Give it to someone you don't know near you and say hello. Okay? Take out your card and give it to someone nearby you. This is social networking. Connecting for networks is actually very valuable, and that is what the FTPI does. So let's do that now. And then ask them one question. Can you help me make more money? <laughs> if they say, I can help you make more money, take that card, write down, call this person. And that's what net social networking is about. It's about enabling greater catalytic changes, just like that catalytic converter for carbon you can actually catalyze Thailand by increasing connectivity. Okay, third one, you can sit down now. Ready? I want you to all take out your phone. Take out your phone. And then, um, so if you get bored while I'm talking, you can take that out and start texting. The reason is in Silicon Valley, we're not afraid of technology. We use this as an indicator that our speech is boring, right? So just. Your way to vote is say, oh, I'm kind of bored. You start doing this. I will make sure my screen is more interesting than this one, all right? So don't be afraid of technology. Use it to uh, drive uh, innovation. So using this, let's kind of go into these technologies uh, and innovation a little harder. So enterprise innovation. So these are the three questions you can ask. Can we build an innovation system that actually works? Because many times when you, a company tries innovation, it doesn't really work very well. How many of you experienced that? You try an innovation uh, pilot and nothing happens, right? Second one, how do, you, how do you do innovation that's big enough that it actually is noticeable, right? And the third one is, you know, the company actually is very smart. It creates antibodies to change because it wants to survive and not do too many crazy things. How do you deal with the corporate antibodies? to change you, the company at a genetic level to be more like Google. So the question is, is it even possible 
for large companies to truly innovate? Or is it, don't even try it, just go to small SMEs to do it? I believe that large companies can do it, and my experience has uh, proved this. So my first project as a consultant was to help Wells Fargo Bank. Have you heard of them? They're like one of the largest banks. But I joined them after the uh, dot-com revolution. And they said, can you help us understand this dot-com? And using the technology that we uh, did, they actually became the number one bank in the US. Uh, this person was the head of the internet project I worked for. The funny story is this. He, um, I did a number of projects for them, and they were very successful. And one day he called me and said, I'm going to email you an article. And I said, great. It was in uh, corporate banking. And a reporter asked him, off the top of your head, what were the three most uh, successful innovation projects? So he said, this one, this one, and this one, right? Then uh, the next day when he uh, got, or the next day he got the article, he realized they were my projects, right? So he said, the things that you were doing actually worked. So the most important one we did is we, I partnered with a professor at Stanford Design School, and we created a technology transfer to understand how to do something called ethnographic design research. Have any of you heard of this, ethnography? Okay, this is the secret weapon for Silicon Valley. Every Silicon Valley company has an ethnography department that actually figures out how to, how to build tech, uh, technologies that have great adoption. Um, so anyway, the, using this technology, they uh, tried it first on a treasury management workstation. Uh, the project had initially failed, right? So a large consultant went in and said, we can help you build this product. Uh, the budget was $2 million. At $20 million budget, they gave up. They said, we cannot figure out how to build a product. So they actually had our team come in and help. We figured out how to get them to reduce the feature set to what customers really wanted instead of every feature. And then they finished it in 12 months, saved millions of dollars, and it was a hit product that drove treasury management as a sales item. So they said, this is interesting. How did you do this? And I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, how do you come up with good ideas? I said, oh, we do this thing called uh, ethnography. So they said, teach us that. Don't, you, we don't want to pay you for products more and more. Teach us how to become like you. So we developed a system uh, that helped them um, unearth better products. And what it was was a team that would go and live with a customer for two days and watch them and then listen and then say, you know, I think if you do this, it would actually help you. And they don't care about money. They don't care about making money from them. So this team actually went out um, and created the world's first banking ethnography group. And they would listen to stories. So they would hear stories like from, there was a small financial service company that was using Wells Fargo as a lender uh, to finance their smaller loans to other companies. And Wells Fargo had lost the check in their, uh, the, they were supposed to send them a $1 million check, and it was misplaced. So the president of that company, we got him on videotape crying, saying, I was so afraid that we would lose our business. So when the president of Wells Fargo saw that, he went, oh, how come we lost that check? And it's because they had a lockbox, the, uh, the truck that goes to get the checks. Uh, they were using a third party, and they realized that nobody wanted to do that business because it was difficult. So they bought the lockbox company, fixed it, and has the best lockbox service in the industry, and then they solved the problem. So by understanding the needs of your customers, they were able to build it. The funny story is that um, the, the guy that I trained how to lead this division, he was doing his various things, and the VP of sales for all of Wells Fargo walks in and says, you know, that one company, um, can you tell me what you did with them? He said, oh, we." Um, we went in and explained ethnography, and it, so we listened. And I said, what did you uh, end up saying? So we said that we noticed that they were doing something that was inefficient, that they should use this one product we had, a tiny little product. It was, uh, it was actually the treasury management product, product. And the VP of sales said, we've been trying to sell this to them for five years, and they buy it from you like this. So we want you to stop teaching, stop doing this with other companies, and teach my salespeople how to do what you do. So they actually taught the entire sales force how to do this. And they've estimated that uh, it generated $20 million in impossible sales using this technique of ethnographic listening. So, uh, 
And the, the VP put a uh, testimonial in one of my books. So this is the kind of thing that you have to learn in order to be more successful. This is the reason Steve Jobs is successful. He knew how to listen to customers and hear at a deeper level. Okay? Is this useful information? Okay, let's go on. Um, here's another one. Uh, the, uh, it's about how to innovate. So the uh, executive vice president of wholesale loan servicing, there was a contest at the bank uh, where they took five of the leading idea management systems. How many of you have an idea or innovation management system inside your company? It's like, soft, it's like ERP for innovation. Well, these are very standard in the US. So they tested five of them, and we were one of five. So they gave it to each division, and then they would see how useful it was. So this person uh, ran the least innovative group. Loan servicing uh, had uh, 400 employees and had only produced five ideas in the previous year. So the average number of ideas per employee is one-tenth of the headcount. So if you have 5,000 employees, usually these systems will unearth 500 ideas, of which maybe 50 are valuable, and five or 10 would be implemented and worth a million dollars. So this group, it was the result of many mergers. And because they, all they did was, they didn't do any technology, they just processed loans, they thought, oh, this is the least uh, innovative division. So all the, uh, my competitors, they went to the tech companies because they wanted the highest number of ideas. So I said, we'll take this one because we want to see how much we can take a low producer into a high producer. It turns out that their culture um, forced them not to innovate because it was very boring work. And so they just like did the work and they didn't try to innovate. But they had close to 20 years of pent up innovation and frustration. Right. And then what we said is, you know, you can actually now complain because they had a no complaining culture. And when you complain, you just have to add an idea to fix it. So this thing in the first six months, we generated 700 ideas out of 400 people. We beat the tech groups 10 to 1. Right. Uh, so it was um, it was actually really amazing. And they were quite uh, amazed at the software. We we were very careful to do a training as well. So we did everything it took to have a really big win. Thailand is like this. You've been frustrated for many, many years. And you have great innovation potential, which should explode and take number one. So that is what I recommend, is that do whatever it takes to implement this kind of uh, miracle for, for the country of Thailand. And it's absolutely possible. The other thing I want to tell you is that this vice president, she said the most interesting thing was this loan processing group uh, had only been producing five loans per day is their average, right? Because it's a lot of work you have to check. Never broke five loans a day in 20 years because that was the average. The minute they installed an idea system, the level of morale went up and it broke into six. So she said that there was an immediate inf impact on processing throughput because the employees felt listened to and engaged. So that's a very interesting data point. So by putting the correct innovation system in your company, the underlying processing of other, other things could improve. I have a drink of water. OK. So what are the inhibitors? Um, if you don't have a systematic approach, if you just say, hey, let's just do this innovation contest, or we can do this one uh, software. It won't work. And the reason is because uh, innovation is a complex system. So a very good biological uh, equivalent is HIV. HIV is kind of an intelligent virus that has antibodies, and it's very difficult to treat. So the doctors, when they gave it a retroantroviral, it would like go in and make the person feel better, and within a week, they would get sick again. So they decided to put two of them together, and it lasted a month. So you, they would get sick again because the virus would adapt. But for some weird reason, they found out if you put in three antivirals, the virus couldn't figure it out. It exceeded the computing power of the virus, and the patient actually would recover, uh, and would recover for quite a while. 
In fact, these retroantroviral cocktails have just been used to treat, in Thailand, have been used to treat the uh, coronavirus and has been successful. So they mixed it with a flu vaccine and injected it into a patient who is 70 years old. She was dying from coronavirus. And in three days, she recovered, and it was no sign of virus. So the Thai doctors, by being innovative, came up with a cocktail uh, solution. The same thing can happen in a company with innovation. You have to do a cocktail approach that's comprehensive. You have to have training, strategic alignment, uh, corporate leadership, software. Many of these things need to be embedded in the company. And if you do this cocktail of multiple treatments, you can actually move the needle and do big innovation. If you just do one thing, it'll last for a week and then go away. So that's what we've been teaching and doing are these comprehensive um, innovation programs that increase the speed of innovation in companies, increase engagement, and decrease your risk of innovation by doing things. So if you think about it, if you talk to a typical manager and say, let's do three innovation projects simultaneously, they say, too complicated, right? Just do one at a time, kind of logical. But that's actually more risky because it doesn't work. So what we do is we say, you actually have to make a commitment to kind of big innovation and drive it through. OK, so this ev innovational evolution happens through many things. So the approach that we use is called agile innovation. How many of you have heard of the term agile? OK, good. So agile is like a speed speedometer when you're driving. It tells you how fast you're going. Before this, you have no idea, because if you're like developing software and, you're, and your programmers, they don't want to be fired. So if they're behind schedule, what do they tell you? Don't worry. It's a little bit behind schedule, but I can be OK. right? And then the next week, they say more. The next week, because you're not tracking, you don't have a speedometer. Six months later, they go, I'm sorry. You know, I'm completely behind. Then you fire them and get someone else. That's the typical way of doing uh, software development. Agile actually is an agreement with the programmers. If you tell the truth, you know, we will stop this sooner, but we won't fire you. Plus, we will do things like stand-up meetings. We reduce the number of meetings to one, one 10 minute meeting a day, so you can spend your time trying to fix the problem. So it's a speedometer. Innovation is like a map. It's like having the corporation say, we want to go in this direction that's strategic, and then everyone goes there. Agile innovation is like a GPS system. You combine the two. You track innovation capacity and uh, achievement along with directional guidance so that you can get to where you want to go. So if you could build a GPS for cars, you can build a GPS for companies. And that's what we do. We, we create agile innovation systems. And the very easiest thing you can do is called an agile design sprint. So it's a uh, simplified agile process that we found out can be adopted by companies very easily. And we're going to teach a sample of that in this afternoon. But to let you know how powerful this is, Google Ventures does an agile design sprint for every new project. But do you know about this? They don't tell anybody. You know. so, but these techniques can be used by Thai companies. And we're talking to the FTPI about uh, being able to bring these technologies to Thailand. So how it works is a very simple six-step process where you understand the problem, you come up with ideas, you um, converge into a model, and then you prototype it very quickly. Then you validate it, and if it didn't work, you go back and start over. This cycle is an agile process for innovation. So instead of using agile or lean in a cyclical manner for uh, manufacturing, you apply it to the innovation process. And then the last step is an introspective. It's a retrospective view of how well you achieved. So you could try to improve that. <clears throat> so we will uh, describe this more in the afternoon workshop. Uh, but let me tell you a few things. Um, basically, every major company does this now uh, in Silicon Valley. How many of you ever heard of a design sprint? You haven't, right? So this is actually. Uh, the thing that you can learn, it's an immersive, high-speed, high-energy workshop. Uh, and we, we kind of focus this on the blockchain. How many of you have heard of blockchains again? 
Okay. So we, we help people build blockchain products more quickly as an example. So the key thing that we do is this thing called a business model sketchpad. Uh, we help people develop this model, one page model, and then when you develop this, you can actually show it to management and they can look at it in a single page and say, it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And uh, pairing this with a prototype of something actually working is very valuable. Uh, what Google does is they do a five-day process. The first day is uh, learn, brainstorm, uh, converge. Then they spend one day to prototype. We notice that Google can prototype in one day, but the average company needs two weeks. So, so what we do is we do a two-week uh, prototyping stage. Then we come back and we analyze it to uh, move forward. Okay, so that was how the process works. But what's key is how do you come up with better ideas? So we actually have a technique for that. What we did is we studied um, Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, and Richard Feynman, the physicists, and they all had this one simple method, which is to look at an innovation from multiple perspectives. So we call this multivisioning. Um, the idea is that some people think that innovation is like drawing a painting, uh, and it's not exactly like a sculpture. You have to look at it for, from different views. So the views, uh, for example, are you know, how do we make this idea bigger? So it's a million idea. How do we turn it into a billion dollar idea? How do we turn the idea upside down? How do we make it open? How do we uh, flip it around, reverse it? How do we uh, think about the impact with our ecosystem? By, by changing the view, you can actually take a half-baked idea and then fully bake it into something more valuable. And again, we'll do a demonstration of this in the workshop. So, but uh, if you're not taking the workshop, these are the rules for how to do a brainstorming. Um, the important thing is to actually increase the volume of ideas so that people actually do them faster. So what we've noticed is that if the CEO is in the room and they kind of do this, that, that will stop innovation, right? Because people are afraid they're upsetting the, the CEO. So we, the first thing we do is we teach the CEO, no matter how bad the idea is, they welcome it. They say, thank you, you know. And if you do this, it actually increases it. And I was wondering if you would like to, an experiment in how to do that right now. Is that, so do I need a, a, a volunteer to come up? Come on, someone raise your hand. Anybody want to try this? Is someone an innovator out there? Please come up, please come up. Okay, come on right here. So I need you guys to help. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna give, does someone have a watch? Okay, I need a watch for 60 seconds. And he's gonna come up with as many ideas as possible to, uh, uh, for, like just invent things for the kitchen. Kitchen. Okay. And then what I want all of you to do is go, bad idea, terrible idea. Okay, whenever he says an idea, get out. And then your face looks, oh, no good. All right? And then we're going to count how many ideas he comes up with. Do we have a, okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Ready? So everybody, are you ready to say bad idea? Okay. So ready, go. When I have my idea. Already don't need to consume. It's already in my stomach. Already in your stomach. No, no, good. Okay, keep going. That's one idea. Next. I want to fry eggs without oil. Okay, two ideas. Next. Oh, I have no idea. I have I, no I, idea. I, 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 need, I need to eat salty without salt. Salty without salt, right? I like that, but everyone, you should say no, bad idea. Okay, three ideas in 30 seconds. Now we're going to flip it. Ideas for the bathroom. And I want all of you to get up and cheer for him every time he has an idea. Okay? Bathroom? Yes. Bathroom. Ready? Uh, we are going to begin now. What's your water? Yeah! yeah! Come on, scream. <laughs> Next. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I need to, to feed my hair without shampoo. I mean, uh, just one soap to cover everything. Okay. <laughs> yes. Then. Okay. Without without towel. Yes. <laughs> I have no idea. 
Okay, but that's enough. But, but the point is, how do you feel? Yeah. When I, people actually give you positive feedback. No, for me it's nothing. It's for you it's nothing because you're yeah, an innovator. Even, even no, yes, for me. Yeah, so for some people, if yeah. they say no, that makes them innovate more. But for your employees, it's the difference. You know, you <laughs> actually have to be very positive. So let's give him a big hand. Thank you, sir. Can you? Uh, thank you. So that's uh, the idea. There's a thing called the plop. It's like when you go, mm, like that. If you do anything like that to an employee, they will stop coming up with ideas. So you actually have to train the company to support bad ideas. Because usually when the water comes out, it's dirty first, right? Then clean water. So let the, the bad ideas come out first. Applauding wildly for really crazy ideas is the best skill you could have at your company. Just teach everyone how to applaud for bad ideas. Then the bad ideas will wash out. Then suddenly very good ideas will come. Um, then the person leading the brainstorm, what you want to do is if everyone just has lots of crazy ideas, it's not as good as if, if it's directed by the corporation, right? So learning how to guide the areas of energy and passion are very important. And then this technique of multivisioning that we can teach you in the workshop um, is the, the best skill because uh, usually brainstorms get a lot of energy, then they die out. When they die out, you change the vision, change the idea, and you make a suggestion, like how do we make this more open? Then it actually drives it up. So you can do things like this. So we, we teach these techniques which should be learned by uh, every company in order to uh, be more innovative. Okay, to give you an idea of how we innovate at our company, because my company is half consulting, the other half are uh, a venture incubator. So these are the ideas that we're working on. Okay. So we had a question, how do you prevent the next pandemic? Right, it's a very interesting question. So what we decided is, could you use a blockchain to accelerate the development of vaccines and infectious disease? So we partnered with uh, the two virologists that uh, sequenced SARS uh, ten, you know, 10 years ago, and they're very smart. So we suggested this idea of using a mathematical tree where the idea is the root, and then as it grows, Everyone who gives value to it extends a branch out. And then you can actually patent different parts of it. And the tree actually supports many patents that are cross-linked and cross-licensed. And it creates a adaptive patent pool to have herd immunity against people trying to sue. Uh, our theory was that this could increase the speed dramatically. Right now, if uh, a lab in China discovers a new uh, virus, they'll call the labs in you know, Europe and the United States and say, we think we have a new virus. And, this, and then that lab will say, please send it to us. We'll start sequencing. They'll say, no. How much do I get of the vaccine? What percentage? It would usually be two or three weeks of negotiating before they release the virus. Right? So our idea was to put this on a blockchain, have it managed by the Nagoya protocols from the UN, and then drive faster development. And our theory is that the 18 months time for a vaccine could maybe shrink down to 15 months. But if it's a true pandemic, this could save 1 million lives. Okay? So we actually wrote this up um, a year ago, and we submitted it to Science Journal, and it's supposed to be published this week, this week or next month, um, this month or next month, because of the coronavirus. So we actually got something good out of the coronavirus. So it, it pushed this uh, paper up to the publication. But we have a, a software system to do this. So this is the kind of thing you can do with a blockchain. You can address uh, problems like that. So another one is uh, one of my biggest customers is the Universal Postal Union, which is a subset of the UN. And it manages 220 post offices all over the world. So we didn't want to just do a blockchain for a company. We want to change the entire postal network with blockchain technologies and quantum computing. So that's a project that we're doing, and we're, it's called the Universal Postal Blockchain Consortium. And we're working on technologies to uh, revolutionize the postal industry. And we picked it because it's like that uh, division that did loan processing. It's the least innovative industry. And we like the countries and the industries that are least innovative because all this energy for creativity is locked up. 
and can be released with the right techniques. So um, what we're going to do is a number of blockchain pilots. For example, the uh, international money order system currently transacts uh, about $200 billion a year. Uh, but it's based on paper, so it's kind of expensive. It's a few dollars. They charge, I think, 50 cents for $100 for a transaction. If you put it in a cryptocurrency blockchain system, you can reduce the cost of this tenfold. It could be the cheapest and most effective remittance device in the world. And the post office already has reach to every rural village in Africa and India. So it's a very interesting idea to use the post office to create a crypto. Another thing we're talking about is physical internet. Um, have any of you heard of this? It came from Georgia Tech. It's a new idea. It's very popular in the US now. So you know how internet routers work? So when you send an email, do you know how it work, gets to another place? So it goes to a packet router, and it tears the email into packets, and it sends it over different places. And then it arrives, and it reconstructs it, and then you get the email. So they want to do that with trucks. So instead of one container in the back of a truck, they want a truck container to be modularized with snap together pieces. It gets into a sorting center. It gets spit up like an internet router. gets sent to different trucks, and they're sent to places. And to do, if you do this, the Procter & Gamble funded a study. They're estimating this would save $5 billion a year in logistics costs for the US and would reduce carbon footprint 30% by using the physical internet system. So it uses smart containers and uh, optimization of route, routing. And the other one we're doing is quantum optimization. Um, it's very complicated. I don't want to go into it. But what I will tell you is that we recruited the 20 top PhDs in optimization technology and quantum computing to work on this. Uh, to give you an idea of what's possible, remember quantum computers can run like 100 million times faster than regular computers. Our theory is that the uh, logistics optimization uh, would give you maybe two or three orders of magnitude better uh, performance. So right now, if you look at FedEx, it has about a 1% failure rate for uh, delivery uh, compliance. So that means 1% of the packages show up late. The post office in the US is 3%. And outside of the US in smaller countries, it's closer to 5%. But if we can get a one order of magnitude improvement on optimization of routing, that would bring 3% to 0.3%, and they could beat FedEx. If quantum computing actually works at the full quantum level, which is maybe three orders of magnitude, no package would ever be late for Christmas. So that's the vision for how you could do this. So we look at this, and for the postal industry, five years is tomorrow because it moves so slowly. OK? Does anyone have any questions? Really? Isn't this interesting? Don't you have any questions about quantum? Like, how many of you have quantum computing projects in your companies now? OK. How many of you think this is maybe don't have to worry about this for a few more years? OK. Next. Um, how am I doing on time? I think I have. Have we been, uh, are we over 30 minutes yet? OK. So I'm going to talk about how to actually uh, make Thailand number one uh, in innovation, all right? So the vision we have is like the post offices. We want the post offices to beat FedEx. We want the human race to beat the viruses. And we want Thailand next year to beat Vietnam on the ratings and then become number one in Southeast Asia and then become like Japan and Korea, one of the larger countries. And this is totally doable if we can actually all connect and work together and follow the leadership of people like Dr. Santhi. So let's talk about what we're thinking, uh, thinking about. Um, innovation in a country requires this catalyst approach where you have different factors. Like that cocktail solution, you have to create an uh, entrepreneurial base. You have to get the government to support it. The corporations need to, to work on it. You have to access venture capital. So what we want to do is increase innovation ca capacity throughout the entire country. Uh, the first step is to declare that Thailand is an agile country, right? So we're going to teach agile in all the universities uh, and, and in the companies. 
and actually make it start uh, behaving like a U.S. competitor instead of an obedient manufacturing partner. Uh, we want to stimulate innovation economy growth, job growth. That means not bad jobs, but good jobs. Another thing we want is to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem, attract global branding for the country as an innovation hub, uh, leverage emerging technologies that actually work. For example, Thailand actually has um, an advantage around biomedical research because you have, you have very good hospitals that are low cost. So instead of saying, oh, we cost less than America, come over and do medical tourism, if a few of your doctors invented new surgical procedures, you could say, oh, we invented it. We're the world leaders in this. And then suddenly you're not low cost. You're like primary. And I've, I actually went and visited some hospitals and tried. Your hospitals are as good as the US. And you can win there. But you have to uh, start thinking like Thailand is number one. Shall we do that again? Everybody, just Thailand is number one. Come on. Thailand is number one. Thailand. So, so notice that you didn't, right? It's because everyone in the country is a little laid back and saying, well, is it possible? That's the key. You actually have to want to do it. And that means that you need to engage right now. So, let's, so I'll tell you another story. Um, a company in India uh, contacted us. Said, oh, you're very good with the software. We want to buy it. Uh, but we're pretty innovative already. And I said, how innovative? How many ideas per employee? They said, we have 15,000 employees, and we have 15,000 ideas. I said, wow, very impressive, very good engagement. So they invited me over, and I looked at the database, and I said, these ideas are not very good. They said, that's why we uh, invited you. We don't know how to improve the ideas. So I said, what was the prize? They said, oh, we gave away an iPad. And I said, anything else to get you this many ideas? He said, oh, yeah, the CEO said, if you don't put in an idea, you're fired. OK? So almost everybody went to the internet, copied an idea, and pasted it. Right. So of the 15,000 ideas, it wasn't 1,000 that were good. It was less than 20 that were good. Everybody else just followed through. So they said, what would it take to actually make a difference? So we interviewed a lot of the employees, and we, we asked them, what would it take? And we came up with the following idea. We, we asked one. Uh, uh, secretary, right? So I said, we noticed he didn't participate. He goes, yeah, we did. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's because, you know, someone from the tech group will win. So I didn't think I would win. I said, what about the prize? He said, oh, yeah, it was an iPad. I already have an iPad. You know, I don't want to want an iPad. So she said, you know, I love my job, but, you know, I have a family. I have the things to worry about. And I didn't think I could win. So I said, what if the prize were a college education for one of your children, right? And she said, is that possible? And I said, that's what we're going to recommend to the president. And then they went, if the prize were a college education, I would ask every family member and every member of my neighborhood to come and work with me to come up with an idea that would win this prize, because that actually matters. So engagement is driven when you actually have prizes and, out and uh, outcomes that engage you emotionally. So right now, when I give a lecture, you're saying, oh, this is an interesting lecture. He's kind of interesting, and he gets us to shake hands and stuff. But what I'm saying is that you control your future. Right now, if I say, get up and say, Thailand is number one, if you all got up and screamed it, Thailand would become number one. But right now, you're all going, is it possible? Thailand has lots of problems. You know, the government's difficult. Is this job giving me enough? You know, I have to work three other jobs to make my, you know, so all these things come up. But what I'm saying is, if I said, let's get up and scream, Thailand is number one, and every single person in this room got up and did that, Thailand could win. It's all about engagement. So with this one secretary, I had a video camera when we do our research. I said, great. I'm going to give you uh, five minutes to come up with the best idea you ever had and on video and show it to the president, right? So she went, oh, and she actually broke out in sweat. And then she literally came up with a decent idea. She wanted to create a, a coaching program where every employee would go and coach a kid in the, in the local schools for 30 minutes a month, right? It was a very good idea. So she was very happy with this, and I got her on videotape. Then I shut everything down. And then as I was leaving, she said, wait. I have another idea. 
Because once you start that idea mill, they keep coming out. Her second idea was, what do we do about old people, right? You know, my mother, so like how we, so she started coming up with ideas because once you activate the idea muscle, it continuously pours out good ideas. And that's how you can win, is by uh, engaging the people of Thailand. So I'm going to ask you again, please stand up and scream, Thailand is number one. How many of you are standing up? Come on, let's stand up. Just, just do it. Just one time. Let's prove we can do it. Okay? Every, see, your leaders are standing up. So, Thailand is number one. Thai, number one. Thailand is number one. You, you actually can do this. But it requires this level of engagement and actually caring. So if you can get the citizenry to actually do this, you can change this. So one of my favorite stories, I don't have a slide for it, there's a movie called Spare Parts. You can sit down now. In America, there's a great movie called Spare Parts. It's about a, um, it's a true story. There was a, uh, a high school student who wanted to join ROTC, um, but he was a dreamer. He, he actually came from Mexico, didn't have papers. But in order to, to do this, he needed to get some credits. So he noticed this little poster that said, uh, compete in the robotics contest. So he was in a low-income high school and had nothing, right? So he talked a bunch of his fellow classmates and the chess teacher uh, into funding a robotics project. It was an underwater robotics project. So they had no money, so they begged for money from the neighborhood. They raised $200, and they bought uh, used pool equipment, right? And then one of the students was kind of a hacker, so they put together a robotic system, and they built it. And then they, they took the teacher's van, and they drove to the competition. And what they didn't realize is that it wasn't a high school competition. It was a college competition, right? And the, comp the, the college that they were competing against was um, MIT, right, which had won every year. And they got a grant for $30,000 to build an underwater robotics contest. So there was this contest with all the colleges. Then they had a little contest for the high schools, right? So uh, the, the uh, teacher of the chess class, he actually had this very crazy idea. He said, you know, if we just go to the one with the high school, uh, we'll lose, right? And then we have to be losers. But if we just compete in the one with the colleges, you know, even if we lose, we can tell people we competed against MIT. Right, so they entered the, the, the one with the colleges. The amazing thing is that this um, team, because they had to be very engine, had a lot of ingenuity, and they were using uh, kind of not metal parts, but pool supply parts, they actually built a device that won the contest. Right, and one of the things that uh, won it for them was in the last interview, they asked, oh, what was your budget? So the MIT person said 30,000, 30, okay, great. And then uh, they asked this kid, you know, what was your budget? He said 200. 200,000? No, $200, right? <laughs> they went, this is amazing. They ended up winning the contest, and it's a true story. They beat MIT because they thought it was possible, and uh, every single kid actually in that group went on to college as a result of that. That's the kind of way you win, by thinking it's possible and taking on the big guys. So, I think that Thailand could take on not only Vietnam, but you can go after Malaysia. You could probably beat Malaysia. Korea and Japan, different, right? It's going to be very difficult to beat them. But at least you would actually uh, move up in the rankings. All right? So what else do we need to do uh, to win? I'm sorry, it's not working. Thank you. So. We have a system called a master plan uh, system. We usually use it for companies. So uh, we've done this about 100 times for large companies. Uh, the average price is a million dollars for a company to do this. What we would like to do is we're working with the FTPI to discount it and enable Thai companies to do it at an, a budget you can afford. And then we also want to try to propose doing this for the entire country, to build an innovation master plan for the entire country to build what we call an innovation grid that would support companies and SMEs because it is possible to win. All right, 
So what it does is it uses this multiple sprint, sprint agile approach. You first start with uh, learning and then building leadership. Uh, next is you come up with strategy for the country. Next, you actually have an innovation portfolio. Uh, so in portfolio management, you minimize risk by having a diversified investments. So we'll talk about that a little later. Then we can train people, and then we can actually build the infrastructure, like with incubators all over the country. And I think it's possible to lift uh, with the right plan, which could be doable in under six months, have a solid plan for the country to move forward into the future. So this is my big idea. How do we pay for it? Right? Isn't that the big idea? Go to your boss and say, we want to do innovations. How do we pay for it? So uh, how many of you have heard of Bitcoin? Anybody Bitcoin? OK, so you know what cryptocurrency is, right? Where did it come from? Someone had an idea. They said, we're going to do this Bitcoin. Then people started investing in it and believing in it. What is the value of Bitcoin today? It has a market cap of $150 billion. It is worth $150 billion, and it came out of nowhere. And you know, underneath the Bitcoin, nothing, right? So is it possible for the country of Thailand to do the same thing, to create a national innovation Bitcoin or token or a cryptocurrency out of nothing, except that the government say, OK, we will raise 1 billion baht. And then we'll break this into 1,000 1 million baht grants for 1,000 startups all over the country. But what we're going to do is take 10% of those companies and put it back together and hope that you know, some of them become very successful and pay back the, the investment. But what the government will do is they will also apply a, a guarantee that the, the Bitcoin will not go down. So it will guarantee the level. So the Bitcoin's biggest problem is it goes up and down, right? So people are afraid to put money in. If there were a Bitcoin guaranteed to only go up, how many more people would invest in it, right? So it's possible here to create a billion baht out of nothing and then send it to the right uh, companies. Now, how you do that is actually uh, more difficult. And we've uh, done this before with other countries. But the important thing for the government to realize is you have, if you have 1,000, 1 million baht grants, you can send some of it into the regions where you don't get enough votes and you could win votes. So it's actually a political device as well. So this idea of a national innovation token or crypto is kind of an interesting idea and it's doable within a year. I have a friend named uh, Brendan Ike. He's the CEO of Brave Software. So how many of you have heard of Mozilla, you know, the Mozilla browser, Firefox? So he, he developed that as open source. When he's left to start his own private company, it's called Brave, he took the browser and it's open source. He made one change to it. Whenever Google tries to put in an ad, he stops it, puts in his own ad, gives half the money to the browser user. So if you use his browser, it'll pay you $100 a year. It's kind of a clever idea, right? And he's a good programmer. So he said, you know, I don't want to go and get yeah, venture capital. I'm going to try to raise the money on, with the Bitcoin, with the ICO. So he was able to raise $35 million in 30 seconds. Now, he was only raising $30 million. And when it turned out, it overflowed. So he turned the server off to stop taking too much money. So it was $35 million. And he did this with no equity because he was selling a token for future use. It's sort of like crowdfunding. So he raised $30 million to launch the company out of nothing. And it took 30 seconds. How many of you would like to raise $30 million in 30 seconds for your company, right? So you can do this. So uh, new companies can do this. Existing companies could do this. You can, if you have a company that makes cell phones, you can say, we're going to do a new kind of cell phone. But this time, we're going to let everyone participate, raise the money uh, on the crypto markets to fund it. If companies can do this, so can countries, right? Why can't a country do this? So uh, let me give you the example of the most famous country who has done this in the past, and that is the United States. So um, who do you think invented uh, paper money? Anybody have any idea? In the 1700s? It wasn't France, and it wasn't uh, the Dutch. It was the US uh, 
colonies. So they wanted to fight a war against England to get its independence, but they had no money. So they invented this idea of paper money. They were called Continentals. And they went to a banker in um, uh, Amsterdam, a Dutch banker, and said, we'd like to raise, I think it was $100 million at the time, which is equivalent to maybe $10 billion today, and said, but we have this like paper money. And the Dutch banker said, it's, so it's like an ICO, right? It's like raising money with crypto. On, and it's not gold. It was this paper. They went, interesting idea. So they actually lent the money against the paper. And the US was able to buy weapons to fund the Revolutionary War. And so the first ICO was the United States itself funding the Revolutionary War with paper money, which was the innovation. What we're seeing now is a new innovation from paper money to digital money. And right now, little companies are experimenting, and it's successful. But it's time for a country to try the same thing. Is it possible for a country to float an innovation token and to uh, use innovation? Because that's actually what creates the most decent jobs. If you take a tax cut and give it to rich people, they'll just leave it in the bank. If you give it to poor people, they'll buy things. It'll increase the local economy. But it won't create jobs. So um, what you want to do is put money into innovation, directly training and increasing the, uh, the job level of a country. So um, we actually have software that does all of the stuff. It's called the OSI, the Operating System for Innovation. We, we, it works with companies. We used it at Wells Fargo. It was very successful. Uh, and we are looking at <coughs> expanding this to be able to work for an entire country at the same time. So if you want to remember something from this talk, it's this. Half the jobs today are at risk of being replaced by robots. In the United States and in Asia, uh, almost all the truck driving jobs uh, will be disappeared within 10 years by robot truck drivers. Uh, manufacturing and customer service. If you have a manufacturing-based economy, it's working for now because your labor rates are low. But if you look in the US, the reason Donald Trump is president is because 4 million jobs were automated by robots in the swing states where he won. And the unemployment rate was very high. Thailand is looking at the same thing unless it can move from manufacturing to product and innovation. Um, the average life of a company in America on the S&P 500 used to be 33 years in 1965. 1990, it became 20 years. By 2026, the average company will only stay alive on the, the S&P 500 for 14 years. That means that 40% of the current S&P will not be on the S&P 500 in, in 10 years. That means they're being replaced by companies that are new. So that means you have to drive new company production to stay ahead of the game. Because old companies are actually going to be hit by quantum computing and AI and other technologies and be outsized. So if there's one thing you want to take away from this, it's that you need to leapfrog your competition. It's no longer enough to like, let's do a little bit better and make a little bit more money. You actually have to think about how do we become number one in Southeast Asia? How do we get up not only above uh, Vietnam, but, but leapfrog Malaysia, right? Give Singapore a little competition. So the way to do that is you have to be more innovative. You have to understand innovation and learn these new techniques like design sprints that everybody in Silicon Valley is using. And you don't know how to do this. So we're going to help teach you how to do that. You need to become agile. And the way to be agile is not to follow. It's to lead. It's to have a government official say, Thailand will be the first agile country, entirely agile. That would be interesting and it would get attention and would drive investment. You need to engage with standards organizations and the community and to each other to find ways to increase uh, sales. You need to master new technologies, especially the ones that you aren't thinking about. Quantum computing, blockchains, AI. And you need to make an investment in the future. And we're saying you could do that without actually borrowing money from the World Bank. You can float a crypto to fund innovation for the next 10 years. And the most important thing is this. When you sit down and you don't stand up, it's comfortable. To become successful, you have to get out of the comfort zone. Okay, because 
Your comfort zone is very comfortable, but you never move. Outside of your comfort zone is all the good stuff. It's success. That means that you need, when I say, let's stand up and say, Thailand is number one, everyone should go, yeah, let's do that. Let's be a winning team, right? Pretend this is soccer, and you're like going to be number one in the world. How excited would you be? This thing is the game that makes your life uh, wealthy and prosperous. It's by working together as a country to change and transform uh, the nation through innovation. And it's possible because you're small enough that you can do this. And the other thing is you're a happy cu culture. You, you actually have the resilience it takes to be successful. In America, if you have a small disaster, everyone's very unhappy and all the news people say bad things, right? But in Thailand, it, you know, after the tsunami, all the pictures I see are people smiling, right? So you guys can smile through it, even though inside it's hurting, okay? So that's the thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to do this one more time. Please stand up and chant, Thailand is number one. Come on, everybody, get up. And I'm going to videotape this because I want proof that it actually worked. Have the cameras come up. Okay, so we're going to try this one time, but... We actually want the energy level very high. We're only going to chant five times. So the first time you do it, actually feel the energy, all right? So let's go. Thailand is number one. Live bigger. Number one. Thailand is number one. Thailand is number one. Thailand is number one. Yeah! Okay, thank you. So um, I have a little time left over. Do, does anyone have any questions? But can you get him a microphone? Microphone? Yeah, there's one coming. For him? Ah. Oh, thank you very much. I was going to pick this up later. They're over there in the... You mentioned about unicorn. But it's one of the million to be success. Oh. But not just for fun. Yes. I think for fun is better. Okay. Right. For me, for fun. Fun is very important. Fun yeah. is very important. But yeah. I, I like uh, extreme sports, so it's fun and dangerous at the yeah, same but, time. No, but this dream for unicorn is almost uh, impossible dream. I mean, but fun is possible. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Winning sir. is fun. Dr. Santi, do you have anything you want to add? Do you want to bring a microphone to him? Please, please add something. Over there. Well, I think it's really interesting, uh, the thing in Thailand. Like yesterday, I also presented that, you see, the two things is uh, competency really important for us is agile and innovation. Okay, innovation, in a way, like you said, the design sprint. I, I read something, but I haven't practiced it. That's why I'm here today. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And the thing is, uh, uh, this blockchain thing, and very really interesting, I, t I told you yesterday, and um, I'm also working on a project on the blockchain for healthcare. Yes, and, I agree. Yeah, and this is very important. And the thing is, uh, today, the easiest way, like what he said, to get the cloud funding. You actually, you can introduce a token, and you can make that token using in the community you're working in. And this is better than Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is back up from nothing. But if you have a program, have a project like a country, but my question is not to you, but to the, our government, and especially politicians. If you set something up, well, good luck <laughs> in Thailand. <laughs> So I, I wanted to make an offer through you. Um, we usually charge for a large implementation of our software, a million dollars. And we also charge for con customization stuff. But we're willing to donate the million dollar software to Thailand's government for free. Oh, so you can take that information to the government. Because I really want Thailand to win, right? I think it's a great country. And uh, like all my clients, I pick the clients that look like they're at the bottom but have a lot of power inside. I think this country has the ability to jump and become number one. Okay? I would like to invest in your country. Oh, Anyone you. else? I take that as a promise. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else?
Come on. This is your life. Anybody have any questions or suggestions for how to be successful? I, I, we can leave now, but you know, it's a... a what? I see not come across the future lab. What is this? It's two? Future lab. Future lab, yeah. yeah. We're half um, a consulting company, so we help interesting, but we only do that to learn from customers. The other half is a incubator. We do, we do interesting products like blockchain technologies and software. Mm -hmm. And we usually like to invest the software into things. Um, so we can talk about that later as well. Okay. But anyway, I guess that's about it. So I wanted to thank all of you. Uh, how do you say the Kapkun Kap?